Once again, I'd like to thank you for attending the Secure and Automate AWS Deployments with Next Generation Security. My name is David Wright. I'm a Solutions Architect at AWS, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today I'm joined by Vishen Kishani of Palo Alto Networks, who is Head of Consulting Engineering over the Asia-Pac region. And so today we will be talking about a few solutions and how Palo can help Palo Alto Networks can help you with uh, securing your cloud journey. When we look at uh, the events that have currently going, been going on the market, we, we've had the uh, Equifax breach, which uh, exposed 100 million users and their data uh, to uh, bad actors. Uh, even more recently than, than that, yesterday we had Deloitte uh, say that they had had uh, an email server and domain hacked and passwords and usernames and, and credentials taken. So we know that uh, the amount of attacks are becoming more sophisticated, uh, are more elaborate, and a number of these attacks are increasing and becoming daily in, uh, incidents. The cost of those attacks are averaging from the CID report about 6.3 million for a, for a data breach, which obviously for a lot of those large organizations is, is really expensive. However, what is even more expensive is the fact that 70% of users who um, see an organization that has had a breach will avoid using that organization. So there is a massive impact to your business if, if a security or, uh, or uh, application is uh, compromised. So after we've uh, now scared and created the scene around how scary it is, can the cloud actually be uh, be secure? Well, AWS's security is its primary focus. And what that means is, is that we have put a lot of effort and, and, and thought into how to secure the cloud. Now, there's some models that, we've, that we will talk about uh, later called the shared responsibility model. But there's also a lot of other mechanisms that we use, including the ability to use third-party tools, such as Palo Alto Networks, to be able to secure and provide security for the cloud. Now, integrated into the platform, we actually have some in, uh, embedded services which obviously allow for uh, security and secure, securing of applications on the cloud. So, integrated, we have the automated login and monitoring through applications such as CloudTrail, which looks and monitors all of the API calls, and uh, and uh, Amazon Inspector, which allows for a vulnerability report of, app of, uh, of applications that are being run on the cloud. Um, we have simplified access using the IAM, or in, uh, Identity and Access Management, which helps integrate in with uh, existing authentication mechanisms to control access and define policies and uh, access rights to users throughout the applications. And also, we make it easy to secure data both in, in flight and at rest. And we use strong, enforcer, strong encryption mechanisms to do that and offer the ability to use things like uh, the key management system so that you can actually rotate your keys and have a centralized and, and managed uh, encryption key service. So I talked about this a little bit, and I'd just like to go this, into this in a bit further detail. So the AWS Shared Responsibility Model is a model that AWS is AWS uses to actually define the different areas of responsibility. And this is a responsibility between us as a cloud provider and you as a customer. Now, AWS will, will generally secure up to the hypervisor, and then all the parts after that and securing the application in the cloud are the customer responsibility. The AWS, AWS team will um, look after and monitor and baseline a lot of the infrastructure elements that provide the, uh, the responsibilities of the cloud. And then using third-party vendors such as Palo Alto Networks, you can actually build on, on, on top of those services to, and the other services I mentioned earlier to actually build out a secure and enterprise-grade um, security stance that will protect your assets in the cloud. So constantly monitored. So the network is actually monitored by a, a large team of security experts. Uh, the team of, uh, that we use is actually larger than most or any or most organization could even afford to, uh, to have. And they baseline and monitor activities across the, the network to make sure that uh, no bad actors or bad elements are being performed on top of the network. 
Also, with the power of the cloud trail, it lets you actually monitor and record all of those API calls to, to actually be able to monitor what's going on and, and start to alert if, if something strange is happening. Plus, with Amazon Inspector, that you get able to drill down into those detailed reports where you can actually then start to baseline and create a security start, uh, policy and stance from where you want to actually deploy your application. So highly available. So the Amazon infrastructure is built around 44 availability zones in 16 different regions. And so why is availability important in a security conversation? Well, it allows for resilience and it allows for time for infrastructure to be able to sustain and, uh, and be able to um, absorb a potential attack. So things like being able to mitigate DDoS attacks using Route 53, which has a 100% uh, uptime, uh, or being able to use um, something like auto-scaling to be able to dynamically grow infrastructure elements, such as parallel outer networks, that allows it to scale and meet the demand of the potential uh, traffic source and traffic attack. Now, all of those elements are not going to stop the attack, but what it does do is give you important time to be able to analyze what the attack is, gather data, find out where the source is, find out what type of attack is, and give you the time to be able to respond quickly and efficiently when you do respond. So the availability means that it gives you an effective working surface to be able to uh, absorb the attack and then repel against with an effective response. Of course, being able to integrate and get access to, to the cloud is always important. So you have things such as Direct Connect, which gives you uh, a direct low latency uh, connection into your data, existing data center, or you could use an IPsec tunnel and uh, uh, an internet gate, uh, and, uh, VPN gateways to be able to create uh, an IPsec tunnel between an existing data center and into the, into the cloud. Palo Alto Networks, obviously could be used as one of those uh, VPN gateways to be able to then integrate both the IPsec tunnel and a security policy and stance. Obviously, there is also the ability to integrate uh, the IAM console into Active Directory so that it can create a centralized or federated uh, account management for users. So all of this means that AWS has put a lot of effort into getting certified and assured. And this certification is is a, uh, is a tribute to the fact that the cloud is secure. So we have SOC both 1, 2, and 3. We've got ISO 2001, 17, and 18, HIPAA, and on uh, FedRAMP. And here locally in Australia, we have the IRAPA uh, criteria. All of these things means that for organizations that, are, that require certification and require a degree of, um, or a very high degree of security, these certifications um, have, goes away to actually making sure that there are a way for them to understand how secure the cloud are. However, because of the way that the cloud is built, as soon as we an AWS work towards achieving one of these certifications, it means that all of our users accept those benefits. And so by AWS working to, with the most secure enterprises or most secure government agencies, we actually filter down those um, requirements across all of our user base. So the assurance and, and certifications mean that you're getting the best and secure, most secure cloud possible. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Bisham, who will now talk you through around the value that Palo Alto Networks can give when working with AWS. Hey, thanks, David. Uh, welcome to all. Uh, my name is Bisham Kishnani. I'm uh, heading the consulting engineering uh, team in APAC for Data Center Cloud, SD, and MSSP and CSSP business. Let's start with uh, looking at some of the industry uh, leadership positions. Uh, so as you can see out there, uh, we have been uh, clear-cut leaders for last six uh, years. Basically, this is the sixth consecutive year where we have uh, been in the leaders' quadrant, where we have been able to execute and complete uh, the vision or have a clear-cut vision. And for the last uh, almost uh, six to 10 years from the time of inception, uh, we have been uh, innovating and delivering uh, more new features, functionalities on our platform. So just a little bit of heads up uh, for people who don't know uh, much about us. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2005. We actually had a f uh, first shipment out in 2007. Today we've got more than 42,000 customers across 150 countries. 
And uh, last year we delivered around $1.8 billion of revenue, uh, which was 28% year on year growth. So let's start looking at uh, what's really happening into the fields or in the market. Uh, there is a huge tectonic shift which we are actually visualizing and uh, seeing on the field, uh, which is actually uh, driving productivity. Uh, and what we are actually seeing is uh, cloud adoption, uh, which is which is growing by leaps and bounds, and uh, people adapting to virtualization uh, framework or virtualization technologies. They are starting to look at options rather than uh, on on virtualization rather than looking at systems. The second thing what we are also seeing is adaptability on SaaS, uh, where uh, a lot of customers are moving into SaaS based framework uh, or using SaaS applications like Salesforce, Office 365, and uh, others, as you can see on the screen, uh, which is also driving productivity pretty fast. Uh, mobility and BYOD, uh, that's another thing. People want to get connected uh, to all their applications from any devices. And finally, uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, and as you know, the IoT is another big thing. Uh, where uh, we are expecting, if you, if you look at the third party reports, you would basically be seeing that uh, in next few years, you would probably be having around 50 billion IOTs on, on the field. Now, what does this all actually mean and translate in? Uh, so while we are actually going about with all these technologies to drive productivity, uh, you are actually giving more amount of footprints. The attackers, the hackers are actually getting more amount of footprints. So that means uh, the, the, there could be a probability of these guys getting in uh, much higher because now they have a larger footprint. So if I lock down my complete setup within a private data center or between private and public, uh, the footprint would be limited. But the moment I open up to IoT and other devices, uh, the footprint increases. So, so this footprint is now available to the attackers and hackers. So what are they doing on this? So these attackers and uh, hackers are actually, uh, you know, using these footprints to exploit, uh, you know, to run their exploits. Uh, trying to figure out vulnerabilities uh, on, on, on these th things. And they basically use known threats, unknown and evasive technologies, uh, zero-day exploits, credential theft, data theft, uh, mobile and IoT threats uh, to, you know, all, on all these tectonic shifts. The way they are uh, going about uh, attacking or uh, pulling information out so basically, the attack life cycles will remain same, whether it is on the physical devices or on the virtualized network in the cloud, uh, the, the cycle still remains same. So it could be an infected user or it could be a compromised device or an endpoint. Uh, they basically gain a foothold and they move laterally and then they execute their goal. Uh, and, and once they start executing, they are basically going to do multiple things. They could pull data out, they could build botnets, they could harvest uh, bitcoins, or they could just uh, shut down things or completely encrypt your data and ask you for some kind of ransom, which happened in, in uh, recently in the case of WannaCry, where a uh, lot, of, lot of systems were completely encrypted and locked down. So the attack life cycle still remains the same. Uh, uh, there is not much change which has actually happened, whether it is in the physical world or in the virtual world. So as David highlighted uh, uh, previously, uh, security is a shared and a collaborative approach. It's, it's a shared model and you need to have a collaborative approach. It's not a responsibility of any particular vendor or any particular, uh, uh, you know, solution provider. It is basically a collaborative approach. Uh, while AWS is responsible for certain part of security, uh, there is certain part of security where customers are responsible for and that's where we come in uh, and, and try to you know, add our value out there. So as you can see on the screen, where Palo Alto Networks can actually help you is uh, identification of application, building secure security framework uh, around segmentation, user uh, identification, uh, understanding uh, what kind of traffic is coming in and going out, uh, segmenting your traffic, uh, <clears throat> preventing a known and unknown uh, attacks or threats. Uh, in, in short, you could basically be leveraging us to build the same set of security framework what you have been running in your private data centers for, for a long, long time. So a lot of times we get a question that 
if I go about uh, you know deploying the Palo Alto Networks security uh, platform on uh, my VPC, what happens to my security groups? Do I still need them? Uh, yes, very much. That is the first line of defense. In fact, if you look, look at some of the recommended documentations which we have provided, the first line of defense is the security group and it is very much needed and it is uh, uh, even applied to the interfaces of the firewall out there because these are the ones which are actually going to clean up maximum amount of uh, traffic out there and then push the remaining stuff to us. So the value which we get in after the traffic uh, comes in from uh, by, uh, after comes in after passing the security groups is we will be able to identify the application. So what type of application is coming in, what type of application traffic is flowing within the VPC or what has to go out of the VPC. Uh, we will be able to control traffic based on applications. We will be able to prevent known and unknown threats. You will be able to uh, integrate with authentication uh, systems like uh, AD, LDAP, RADIUS, and grant access to users based on identity. So you could actually build policy framework that uh, are completely uh, based on user identity and applications. You will be able to create security zones, basically segmentation, uh, the way uh, we have been doing in our private data centers for a while basically trust, untrust, DMZ zones, and so forth. Uh, you could also automate. Automation is a very, very important piece when it comes to public cloud. Uh, and I will be going into a little bit more details uh, in the subsequent slides. Centralized management and logging, uh, where you could be uh, you know, consolidating all your uh, management to an existing uh, management system and push across all the logs uh, to one central uh, system out there. So let's look at how uh, we go about building the complete security framework when it comes to the AWS security considerations. So we basically bifurcated the whole part into three parts. Uh, one is the account management, and I will be going into a little bit of details in each of them in the subsequent slides, uh, where we will talk about how account management can help you with respect to key rotation, inbound accessible services, unencrypted storage, non-standard AMIs, and password policies. The second part comes in is at the data governance level, where we will look into how we can help you prevent exposed uh, data or uh, data not getting exposed unintentionally, keys stored in open, uh, admin access, and we talk about inline security, where we will talk about segmentation, malware prevention, secure access for the traffic coming in and going out, and VPC edge uh, security. So let's start looking at how does the, these three uh, security considerations uh, are addressed and what are the solutions to it? So for the inline security, it's the VM series, which uh, gets deployed within the VPC on an instance. And, and we will go into more details how this is done, how you can actually go about deploying the same. Uh, we will then look at uh, the, the first and second option, which is basically uh, the account management and data governance, where we will look at uh, how Aperture uh, solution uh, can actually help you uh, take control or have uh, uh, build safety around IAM roles, uh, safeguard Amazon S3 buckets and uh, EC2, uh, EC2 instances. So let's start looking at the first and the second portion, which is account management and data governance. So as I said, uh, this is taken care by Aperture. Now Aperture is a cloud-based solution. It's a cloud delivered uh, security solution. Uh, you do not uh, need any kind of inline integrations out there. It is completely offline. That means you could actually have uh, a completely production setup uh, which is which has been working uh, and Aperture can get integrated with it very, very seamlessly. In fact, it can also do a, a backtrack and look into all the logs which have been there for a while and, and come up with complete analysis as to you know what's really been happening over a period of time. It on the back end also integrates with our uh, APT solution, which is Wildfire, which is a very, very important piece of the complete platform story, which we have been talking about. And uh, any unknown threats uh, would be pushed across to Wildfire to analyze and come up with a verdict out there. Uh, and I'll go into more details of Wildfire in the subsequent slides. So looking at the account management part, 
uh, what all can you look at? So audit IAM security postures, that is key rotations, multi-factor authentication, password hygiene. Now these are some of uh, very important things because we all know that uh, you know employees do leave, and and so if you are not rotating your keys, uh, you never know you know something uh, may not really work in your favor. So regular key rotations is is one of the uh, audit IAM security posture functionalities. Monitor EC2 console activity. So basically security group monitoring to make sure that non-standard AMIs are not being used. Uh, storage volumes are encrypted uh, out there always. Uh, activity uh, monitoring and abnormalities, like let's assume suddenly you start seeing more number of EC2 instances coming up than, than the regular ones, uh, or suddenly you see many EC2 instances being shut down or console activities uh, coming up, or some consoles being accessed from blacklisted IP addresses. So all these three, uh, all all these multiple things can actually be uh, taken care of uh, by using uh, a picture uh, when it comes to account management front. When you look at the uh, data governance portion, uh, we basically uh, look into the S3 buckets. So let's assume you've got some files residing out there. Someone has put in a new file. I need to figure out if these files are clean or is there any kind of malware attached to it? Like maybe someone dumped in some files which has a code into it which could probably uh, you know launch some kind of malware or, or exploit some kind of vulnerabilities uh, these are uh, you know uh, if it is an unknown stuff it is actually pushed across to our threat intelligence cloud uh, uh, and, and an IPD solution which is wildfire where we basically uh, open up these files in different environments to figure out you know what's what's really happening how are they behaving and uh, and and if there is some Something malicious. We basically take an action onto it. Uh, and other things which we do is like detection of sensitive content and exposure. Uh, this could again be unintentional. Uh, maybe if you put in some folders uh, where you decided that these are not going to be publicly exposed, but maybe your master folder had th those rights of publicly available, and and you didn't see it. You know that all can be highlighted. So when we come to the IS protection, uh, it's the VM series, which actually gets deployed uh, in line on your, uh, uh, in your VPC. And uh, if, if you have an existing VPC, which is already running, uh, there could be with a minimum uh, outages, these systems can actually be integrated into the complete network. So let's look at how these are deployed. Uh, very, very simple and easy to deploy. You just need to go to AWS Marketplace and search for Palo Alto Networks. Once you search for Palo Alto Networks, what you basically uh, get is three options, as you can see it on the screen. Uh, the first option, uh, that is a BYOL, which is bring your own license. So when you go about selecting this, uh, it basically runs you through the complete uh, set of uh, inputs <coughs> which you need to plug in. So you basically just need to put the IP address, decide which region, VPC, all those information and launch the system. Once the system gets launched, uh, you can go into it and apply the license into it. The li once the license the license is actually to be bought by the, the customer from either the partner or the distributor, and and you you could start getting your uh, support onto it. The second and third option, which is the bundle option, is basically consumption based or subscription based. And you get billed directly uh, by AWS, uh, which could be an hourly or annual subscription uh, option, whichever you want to select. Between bundle one and bundle two, uh, the difference is basically the feature feature parity or the feature sets. Uh, the bundle two is the one which has all, all the features enabled that includes your wildfire, which is the APT solution and the URL filtering. The bundle one doesn't have these two features. Uh, Support, what happens to support in, in, in case of subscription model? The moment you have launched the, the systems, you can uh, go to our support portal and you could register the systems. And once you're registered, the next very moment you can actually call the tag and get uh, support help. Uh, this actually shows you know how tightly integrated we are on the back end uh, with the AWS. Uh, once you have launched it, you basically uh, you know, start configuring it or tuning it so you could create multiple uh, zones or multiple networks. 
and then build your policy framework around it and uh, simplify the security groups. On the management front, uh, we basically have Panorama. Uh, customers who already have Panorama deployed for the systems which uh, they are using in their private data centers, the same systems can be used to integrate uh, with the uh, VM series which is deployed onto the VPC. Uh, it just needs an IP reachability. That means you can actually configure uh, and push all the logs across to Panorama uh, or from Panorama. And it, it completely streamlines your policies. So automation. This is a very, very important piece when you're looking at cloud because whenever people are moving on to cloud, one of the most important things they look at how we can actually automate things. Uh, if I need to launch five firewalls or six firewalls in different availability zones, uh, can I make sure that all of them are launched in a similar way by one touch and go, or like auto scaling? Uh, yes, all those can be achieved uh, using automation. How do we do that? So let's start looking at that. So first, we have a fully documented bi-directional XML uh, API support. Uh, and it also supports uh, native cloud tools like CloudWatch. Uh, you could have integrations with ServiceNow, uh, different orchestration tools you, you could use, Terraform, Ansible. So, so all these can be used for uh, you know, building an automation framework uh, because we, we, have, we, have, we have and we support bo both ways or bi-directional XML API. Uh, this also helps you build a dynamic policy update framework and I will be going into a little bit more details in the subsequent slides on this, how actually it actually helps you and what are the use cases for it. And bootstrapping, again, very, very important piece when it comes to uh, you know, uh, automation because it takes away a lot of uh, uh, you know, API calls and makes life very, very simple uh, along with API or building an automation using XML API stuff. So let's start looking at uh, one of the important points which we talked about automating uh, a policy update. Now, when you are actually um, uh, uh, on, on public cloud, uh, uh, what really happens is you could, you could basically be building or using auto scaling where you would have multiple instances uh, scaling out or scaling in. Now, when this happens, you want to make sure that your security policy framework also remains uh, uh, constant, right? You don't want to basically go about manually applying or putting IP addresses of the new instances which have come in. So how do we do that? So what we have done is we have built a very tight integration uh, with AWS VPC where once you go onto the system and, and put in the uh, some of the informations which we actually fetch, so the VPC ID and few other parameters, uh, we can actually pull in the tag information or the tag attributes uh, from the VPC. So like, as you can see on the screen, you could have an instance which has multiple tags allocated. So let's assume you put in New York Web Linux. So those tags all come into our site and we can create a group called as New York Web Server, which would comprise New York Web Linux. And we say that, okay, all the three needs to match or either of them can match. The moment that condition or the criteria is met, the IP addresses of, of these systems are automatically reflected or pushed across to us. And we use this dynamic group to basically uh, reflect in our policy framework. Yep, so as you can see, sorry. Yeah, as you can see out here, uh, uh, you will basically see that this New York web server is, is the group which has been reflected in your policy framework. So what happens is when you have a new instance coming up, the IP address automatically is included within the group and you don't need to change your policy framework. Similarly, when you have an instance actually going down, maybe scaled in or had some issues and you pulled it out, uh, it will just be deleted from the uh, group. So it, it, your policy framework is always uh, you know, up to mark. If you do not have this feature, what really happens is you are manually building policies uh, and, and a lot of times these instances when they have gone, you don't even know that they have gone. And what eventually happens is you've got a huge policy out there with a lot of IP addresses which shouldn't be there. So the dynamic address group uh, policy update, uh, you know, takes care of this thing. 
uh, as I said, bootstrapping is a very, very important uh, feature. Uh, it actually helps us uh, big time in the automation. Uh, so basically, we can create a, a folder which could have multiple subfolders within them, having a lot of other information, a lot of files in it, which could be the config files, system level parameter files. Uh, it could have a complete OS. So maybe a new system you wanted to come up with a specific OS, and that's not available as an AMI currently. Uh, the system can actually come up with the AMI which is available on the marketplace and automatically update to the newer one which you've actually put it in the bootstrap file or, uh, out there. Uh, all these files are actually put into an S3 bucket. Uh, you could also have the licensing part of the bootstrap file uh, or the bootstrap folder. And uh, the systems will come up with uh, the complete configuration, uh, updated OS, updated uh, license keys. So it's basically all fully automated, just one one touch, and it's all up and running. So, as I said, you could have configs, you could have content updates, you could have software updates, uh, license, all those parameters uh, actually fed in into the Bootstrap file. So let's start looking at some of the use cases uh, what we are actually seeing. So there are typically four use cases uh, which we see. Uh, first one is the hybrid. Uh, which is which is a very common uh, use case which we see where customers have just started uh, moving some of the workloads onto the public cloud or on the uh, uh, VPC. And uh, once they uh, move it, they are looking at uh, building the same security framework with respect to applications. Because some, some of these guys uh, say that I want certain set of applications to uh, be accessed through my VPNs and certain need to go to internet directly. Uh, so the VM series actually can do both, both the things simultaneously. You could have an IPC terminating onto VM, and at the same time, uh, the, the applications can also be uh, accessed from internet side. The second is segmentation, where you want to make sure that web app database uh, tiers are completely segregated uh, in a VPC. You could achieve that. Uh, you could couple it with the internet gateway. Uh, so basically a segmentation in Internet Gateway could be a joint solution or a joint use case also where application also has access uh, from Internet but it is coming through the firewall which is the VM series. And the final use case is uh, uh, giving SSL VPN to the mobile users. Uh, uh, the, the good thing about this is uh, it's a completely automated stuff where once you deploy the VM series across the 16 regions, uh, or as, as David highlighted, uh, the, the systems can automatically decide which user uh, is to the nearest uh, system, and the best uh, performance uh, uh, system can actually be allocated to that guy automatically. Uh, so remote access is, is another uh, very good feature uh, or a use case which could be used. Uh, auto scaling, a lot of customers have been using this and, and that's another very important uh, use case which uh, we almost see it almost a daily basis where based on uh, the performance or the requirements uh, uh, the systems uh, actually scale out or scale in so let's assume you know during the night time we have less load the number of systems which are there would be reduced during the daytime the the systems need to be more uh, because of the load is heavy they will just scale out so it's a very very important uh, use case so how how do we handle this kind of uh, requirement when it comes to the services layer basically on the security side uh, we could also do that so based on the load whether you need more systems or you need less systems the systems can be scaled out or scaled in uh, the way we do it is basically we use the cloud formation templates. Uh, we use Lambda services. We use CloudWatch uh, S3 buckets for bootstrapping. As I said, it's a very, very important uh, uh, feature. Uh, Pan OS APIs, uh, again, bi-directional, which actually helps us do that. And uh, bootstrapping, uh, which actually gets uh, bootstrap files, which actually gets loaded into S3 buckets. And Panorama to make sure that uh, the centralized management and logging is available. Now, the the important uh, thing to note in auto scaling is when more firewalls are coming up, uh, what really happens is you need to make sure the newer systems which are coming up have the same security framework uh, when it when when it has come up 
with respect to whatever systems are running and because if, if they don't have the same consistent security framework then you need to manually start configuring them uh, yes this can be done uh, and uh, the way we basically do it is, is either via bootstrapping or the panorama so in panorama you could uh, have different set of device groups created and these can have different templates attached to it so whenever a new system is coming up provision using auto scaling it can automatically contact panorama get registered and go under a specific device group and pull all the configurations in so they, they, they will all be in the same sync with respect to configurations uh, one of the uh, uh, real life deployment uh, would be hybrid plus internet gateway uh, where customers prefer to use uh, something called a services VPC where all the traffic which is coming in and going to your private data center uh, goes through the services VPC uh, you could also have internet traffic going out only through the services VPC that means uh, some of the VPCs which don't need to have an IGW will not have it uh, sometimes you have to give an IGW or you need to plug in an IGW because you wanted some kind of patch update so you could actually avoid that by putting uh, everything through the services VPC at the same time certain set of applications which have inbound access running auto scaling and all as you can see uh, you could have uh, uh, systems deployed in auto scaling framework uh, in, in those. So those could be your web uh, uh, subscribing, uh, uh, you know, VPC kind of stuff. Uh, what if you want to actually try these things out? Uh, you could you could just go on to again uh, AWS Marketplace, uh, search for Palo Alto Networks, and once you subscribe for either the bundle one or bundle two subscription model uh, option. Uh, it actually gives you a 15 day trial license out there. Uh, basically after 15 days where you start getting built till 15 days you can actually just run all the features onto it. So uh, there are a lot of documentations also available. If you go to paulaldonetworks.com uh, you will basically be able to search out a lot of documentations. Uh, uh, these are almost deployed uh, uh, you know, use cases. Uh, step by step detail as to you know how the configuration should look like on on uh, the system side on the firewall side and on uh, the AWS VPC side you know what kind of configurations uh, are, are uh, recommended all those details are uh, available in these guides so let me just summarize uh, on all the points which we have just uh, spoken about so one security is a shared responsibility and collaborative approach very very important uh, uniform security framework is some Something which needs to be built across all the data centers, uh, whether it is a private or a public cloud that is on AWS. And uh, as as I started, right, there is a huge tectonic shift which is happening. So more footprints are now available. So it is all the more important that you make sure that uh, you have a uniform security framework across uh, all the touch points. Automation of security, because if you are not going to do automation, uh, uh, the manual approach is going to take you time to go about uh, you know building security framework and and today uh, all the attackers and hackers they have all the tools which are completely automated so it's very very important to uh, you know to either meet or exceed their speed uh, security also needs to be automated yep so ease of deployment application visibility is another thing which we spoke about preventing known and unknown threats uh, using uh, the, the wildfire uh, solution which is an APD solution for unknown threats and uh, using and sharing uh, threat intelligence. Uh, for any additional information uh, you could reach out uh, to us uh, uh, via the link or the sales uh, any sales or channel related inquiries can come into Michael McGrath at uh, mmcgra at uh, paulaltonetworks.com. So we'll open up for Q&A and uh, David will take the Q questions now. Over to you, David. Great, thanks, Bishop. We've got some great questions coming uh, coming in to ask, so uh, that, that's going to be good. If you want to get your questions in, please feel free. We've got some plenty of time, and obviously, this is a great opportunity for you to uh, get access to to these resources. So please ask uh, lots of questions. Um, the first one off the rank is: Does Palo Alto Aperture and Wildfire work with the Palo Firewall device? Sorry, I missed you on that. 
So uh, does the app, does Aperture and Wildfire work with uh, the Palo firewall devices? Okay, uh, so great question. Uh, wildfire uh, is again, uh, it could be in a cloud a cloud option or it could be uh, in an appliance form. It integrates uh, with uh, the firewall uh, or with the Aperture. Uh, Aperture is completely independent. So Aperture uh, can work as a complete independent solution itself. Aperture is basically used for SaaS based solution, so it will be completely independent. Uh, it is not mandatory or necessary that you need to have a, a, a firewall deployed. Uh, but wildfire is something which can integrate with both the things. So basically on the back end it will integrate with the picture. It can also integrate with the firewall. So the next question is, uh, is there any Terraform templates for auto scaling or deployments on AWS? Uh, again, another good question. Uh, uh, so there are multiple things. So on the GitHub, if you go, so github.com slash Palo Alto Networks, uh, and then once you go into that, you will basically see AWS uh, folder out there, and within that folder, there are multiple CFTs and templates which are available. Uh, Auto-scaling templates are completely published out there, and, and if you use them off the shelf, uh, you could basically even get tax support onto it. Uh, the same set of templates with uh, a lot of detailed documentation is also available on followalternetworks.com. Uh, even Terraform uh, and Ansible related uh, uh, options are available out there. So there is a lot of uh, uh, documentation, there are a lot of templates which are already pre-built. And uh, on GitHub we also see that uh, uh, you know a lot of people within the community come and also uh, you know share their, uh, their templates which they have actually built. So can you could you explain how Palo Alto could help with uh, with the use of containers? Okay, so currently, uh, uh, if you if you are looking at deploying the VM CDs on a container, uh, we do not have uh, current support to deploy on the container. Uh, but if you are using uh, containers on the back end, then it's another platform on the back end for us. So we really don't uh, need to bother about whether you're using a container or a VM option out there. What we are concerned is what is the data which is flowing out and we are able to identify that data. Okay, and does, uh, does the, in the auto scaling or Palo Alto uh, device work with the new network load balancer from AWS? Yes, it, it, it works very, very closely with the load balancers because uh, what, what really happens is uh, when, when you have auto scaling kicking in, a lot of times what we have seen is uh, the ELBs, uh, sorry, the ILBs, I should rather say, ILBs or the ALBs, uh, they will basically also scale out or scale in and the IP addresses change. So it is very, very important for us to make sure the NAT policy rules, which are going to send the traffic to the ILBs or the ALBs, uh, need to be in sync. So what we basically do is use the Lambda functions to monitor these and update the policy frameworks accordingly. So how quickly does Wildfire uh, cloud analyze and submit files and send back the report? Uh, it is up to five minutes. Uh, that's the maximum time frame what we have actually seen. Uh, uh, you know, it, it takes. So five minutes or less than five minutes, you basically have a verdict out. Uh, the other thing to note is that this is a, a, a repository which is seeing uh, files coming in across the globe. That means if, if let's assume, you know, a new malware was seen somewhere in US, during the daytime and, and uh, in APAC uh, it's, it's during the nighttime. Uh, what really happens is by the time APAC is waking up, uh, your systems uh, would be patched uh, because this, the, the signatures are updated not only to the uh, customer from where that file came in but across all the customers who subscribed for those services. Uh, how, could you just go into some detail around how to enable site-to-site -site VPN from an autoscale group? Okay, uh, so what you could actually do is, uh, so let's take two, two examples. Uh, one is basically if you are actually building a VPN tunnel into your private data center. Now when you're building a, VP, a VPN to your private data center, uh, you could basically need, you basically need to make sure that in the bootstrap file, all the configuration for IPsec is already put in place. That's the most important part because if you don't have the phase one, phase two configurations in place, your, your tunnels will never come up, even if you had the remaining configurations in place. The other thing which 
if you need to also make sure as your routing uh, options are put in place. Uh, this is on this side. Uh, on, on, on the other side, if you want to also integrate with VGW, the same thumb rule applies. So you need to make sure that uh, if you're going to be running auto, uh, auto scaling and you want to build any kind of VPN tunnels when more systems come up, you need to make sure that, that the configurational parameters are put in part of the bootstrapping file. At the same time, you also need to make sure that the IPsec configurations are already available on the other side. And is the uh, to use Palo Alto and Auto Scaling is the licensing included? Uh, it depends as to what kind of licensing options customers are looking at. So if you're looking at uh, uh, the subscription model, you don't really need to bother because you the the systems will keep coming up and going down based on your uh, uh, parameters what you have set uh, or the load. And uh, you will basically be built directly uh, uh, from by the AWS marketplace uh, because it's a subscription model. So either hourly or annually, depending upon whatever subscription model you have selected. Uh, while if you are looking at BYOL, uh, you could actually go with uh, an ELA option. So we have an uh, enterprise license agreement option, uh, uh, which is specific again to AWS. You could also, uh, you know, look at that because. In that, again, you plug the license part of the bootstrapping uh, process. As I showed that one of the files which uh, can be there is having the licensing parameter. So it could basically have the BYOL, the bring your own license parameter. And, and when the systems come up, they basically license themselves up. Um, is it better to use a dedicated instance for a, a VPN or is autoscaling uh, safe to use with um, VPN tunnels? It depends upon use to use, uh, case to case basis. Uh, very, very difficult to, uh, you know, say that this, every customer requirement uh, can have a different architecture. Okay. And how is uh, RMA support, of, how good is RMA support available in India for small cities? Okay, so first of all, the, the beauty about uh, VM series, it's a software, right? So there is no RMA required because we don't ship anything. Uh, that's the best thing. Second is it's the AMIs are available on the marketplace itself. So what you basically do is just select that and then you know it, it just comes up. And in case uh, if you have one of the systems failing, uh, if you're not running in non-auto scaling mode, uh, typically we, the designs will rec the design uh, we put in place is basically to have minimum two systems. And if one of the system went off for a certain reason, let's assume you know on the back end some something happened onto the server and the server is gone. Uh, you basically spin up, you can always spin up another system and, and re-license it. Uh, licensing flexibility is there. So you can also deactivate a license and activate it somewhere else. Or if you just lost it, you can just call up the tag and they will free up your license and you can reuse the auth code. Uh, can you just talk about uh, some of the performance uh, elements of how Palo will perform on the cloud? Sure. Uh, we have multiple options available. We start from VM100 uh, and go up to VM700. So there are basically four models available or four SKUs. Uh, on the marketplace, subscription model is only VM300, which is the second. So we have VM100, 300, 500, and 700. On marketplace, you only have 300, which is a subscription model. Uh, so if you need a 100 or a 500 or a 700, you will need to look at uh, uh, the BYOL. Now, with respect to performance, we start uh, right up from like a gig going up to four gig. Again, that depend upon the model and, and the instance size, what you're actually allocating to it. So if you want to get a maximum performance out uh, with all the features, uh, we can actually scale up to four gig with 10 million sessions. Uh, and there is a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, instance size, which is required in order to get that uh, stuff delivered. Uh, so, is it possible? So, if a customer is invested in a capex uh, into Palo Alto, is it possible to convert that, those licenses uh, onto uh, cloud licensing? Uh, no, you you cannot uh, just move from uh, uh, capex to opex uh, or opex to capex. Uh, what you basically need to do is uh, you can always back up your configuration. That is one good thing get another system up and running and uh, and and then just push the config up uh, 
uh, it, it barely takes any time and your system would be in uh, in production. Now, if you have an ELB sitting on top of it, uh, the outage could be almost zero because the system will start processing traffic or basically the ELB will start sending the traffic to the newer system only once it is able to reach to the application and the whole path is up and running. So, you know, and it's, it's very, very straightforward and simple without any outage, you can actually do that and then pull the uh, CapEx based system out. Um, can you talk about the advantages of using a decryption policy for inbound HTTPS requests to a web server? Uh, could you just uh, repeat it a little bit again? So could you talk about the benefits of using a decryption policy, so decrypting okay. uh, HTTPS traffic coming in? Yeah. Uh, the reason you would want to look into uh, encrypted traffic uh, is, is because a lot of times, you know, if, if the traffic is encrypted and you're not looking into it, there could be malwares uh, which are which are hidden within that. Okay, so if you're looking at, uh, you know, if you're wanting to, you know, even look at that, then it is recommended to look at this particular option. Cool. If, you, if a customer doesn't have a centralized management system, uh, what can they do with the logs or do the logs get pushed anywhere? Sorry, the last portion I missed out. What? So if, if, if a customer doesn't have a centralized logging, uh, log system, and so they have standalone, okay. uh, don't have a centralized management system, what can they do with the logs? Uh, do they stay on box? Uh, can they be somewhere else? So you, you could you could do multiple things. Uh, one is uh, system also holds certain amount of logs, but you have to realize that system has limited logging capacity. Uh, you could always spin up a, a, a you know a syslog server on on the cloud itself uh, and and push all the logs are out there. Uh, and you could also uh, have an SIEM kind of uh, system available where again you can push the logs. So you have multiple options which are available with you. I think that's most of it. That seems to be all of the questions. Ah, oh, here we go. There's a few more coming in. Uh, is Wildfire Cloud able to analyze encrypted files? Uh, I think so. I'm not very sure on that. Uh, I think so till a certain level, but I will need to cross confirm on this particular point. Not sure. Um, and so. So come, we're coming up for the last few minutes of the uh, webinar, so if you want to get your questions in quickly uh, before we go, otherwise we'll be calling it, rounding out the, uh, rounding out the Q&A session. Uh, in an AWS environment, do you need to check for antivirus and threat, threats updates? Uh, yes, so uh, uh, antivirus uh, updates uh, or the signatures are already part of the threat intelligence uh, on the system. Uh, so that's part of the threat uh, feature feature set which we have it. And uh, these are also regularly updated uh, which get intelligence uh, or the update information coming in from wildfire. So uh, for compliance, auditing and posturing uh, is required. How can Palo Alto help with this? Uh, so you uh, you said for the compliance audit. Yeah, for compliance audit and 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 post uh, posterity, oh, okay. how can help how to help help with this? Yeah. So uh, if you if you uh, uh, saw one of the slides, we talked about some of the value adds which we get in, and a uh, few things which are very very important which we get across is uh, visibility uh, of the traffic which is coming in and going out applications, right? Uh, who's accessing, what is he doing, uh, and, and these are some things which you actually require when you are uh, doing an audit. And uh, uh, without the systems uh, being in there, you have very, very limited visibility. So once the, uh, uh, the VM series uh, from us is actually deployed, uh, all these are uh, available, and as I said, you could have, have the logs pushed into Panorama or to a syslog or SIEM system, where you know you could actually pull out all this information and see, uh, which will actually help you for the audit and compliance point of view. Um, does the IPS inspect HTTP traffic? HTTPS traffic? Yes. Yep. Yes. So that's what we talked about, right? The encrypted uh, portion. Yep. Yeah. And uh, do we need to have antivirus to be installed in each EC2 instance? 
which again goes no, back you do not. to what you're... You do not, you do not need, because we are not a host-based, yeah, so we are not a host-based security out here. Uh, we are basically network-based. Uh, people are actually starting, or rather, have already moved away from host-based. The reason is uh, host-based are very uh, dependent, dependent on the uh, OS versions, uh, the platform what you're using on the back end. Uh, so, you know, sometimes if you're going with legacy stuff or you're using the latest stuff, uh, the, the host base AVs are not going to support it. And, and that's where the challenge is. And you just need one system to be breached and then people will do a lateral movement inside. Uh, we basically on the networking side, we are completely decoupled from this portion. Uh, you just don't need to touch your host, let them just run the way they run. And I'll, I'll call this as the last question. Uh, does uh, Palo Alto have WAF capabilities? Uh, okay, uh, great question. Uh, in fact, I actually hear this from a lot of customers. Now, uh, WAF and us are two complementing solutions. Both can coexist simultaneously, and a lot of customers do that. Uh, if you look at where does WAF play, WAF plays actually in, in purely web-based applications. Uh, and uh, it basically uh, also looks into the code level uh, issues which are there. Where we are actually playing is not only uh, application, uh, sorry, the web web application level, but also any other kind of applications which you have it. So if you look at the whole security framework, how it would look like if you are also having WAF, okay? Uh, it would look like security groups, us, and then the WAF setting below us. And uh, anything which is web uh, based, it will flow through all the three lines. Uh, while anything which is non-web-based, so if you're doing SSH, if you're doing Telnet, or any any other RDP or any other kind of uh, application being used, that is actually going to flow through security groups, us, and then will go into your applications directly. Thank you for that. I'll call that as the last question. Thank you for attending the webinar. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out on the links provided. Thank you, guys.